In the last couple of years, stoicism has become an extraordinarily hot topic on the internet. YouTubers in the personal development niche have been praising this ancient philosophy exceedingly and in the meantime it's been spreading to other areas of content creation as well, to vloggers such as PewDiePie and singers like Camilla Cabello. The clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson, the stoic philosopher Massimo Piliucci and many famous coaches, writers and influencers have been talking and writing about stoicism as a practical philosophy that can improve everyone's lives and help us become happier. The lion's share of today's self-help literature and even modern psychology are partly based on this 2000-year-old philosophy. We can also see that there have been famous people somehow related to it in almost every era after its birth. However, they haven't always been convinced about its inherent wisdom such as, contrary to popular belief, Nietzsche, a famous German philosopher in the 19th century. And this is perfectly normal, there isn't anything so flawless in this world that cannot be criticized. Nonetheless, it is common to forget this fact and learn or spread new knowledge without thinking deeply about the topic's level of truth. Hence, the purpose of this video is to summarize the basics of Stoicism while mentioning its possible downsides or pitfalls one might fall into when learning about it and practicing it. Stoicism Chapter 1 – A Short History of Stoic Philosophy We are now sailing back to the 3rd century BC Athens. A merchant called Zeno of Citium from Cyprus suffered a shipwreck on an island. He later called this seemingly adverse turn the most fortunate event of his life, as it was here that his fresh knowledge from a local philosopher led him to found Stoicism. He joked about the journey after returning home as follows. I had a terrible trip at sea, but the shipwreck went very well. Arriving home from the island, Zeno started spreading and discussing his new ideas at the Stoa Poikile meaning painted colonnade, where the word Stoicism comes from. The story of the origin of Stoicism is itself a great illustration of one of the main inherent lessons. Sometimes the best opportunities are disguised as obstacles. In Zeno's case, this meant the founding of an extremely influential new branch of Hellenistic philosophy. After its creation, the movement went through a lot of change. It had several masters and followers, such as Cleantes and Chrysippus, who all held their individual beliefs on the philosophy. And of course, we have to mention that Stoicism is rooted in earlier philosophers' ideas such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. However, in this video we are only going to cover the most famous Stoics, Seneca, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, who lived hundreds of years later and formed the backbone of late Stoa, the last era of ancient Stoicism. Chapter 2 The Three Most Important Stoics and Their Beliefs Stoicism has several commonalities with Christianity. For instance, both of them are very inclusive and claim that anyone can follow them, from the poor to the rich and from low to high status people. Looking at the three great Roman Stoics, we can see that this principle holds very true in their cases as well. Seneca was a statesman and playwright, Epictetus was a slave while Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome. Although there were differences between their personal philosophies, all three of them practiced and believed in Stoicism. There are a couple of main ideas that connected them, which formed the basis of the movement, such as the importance of serving the common good, acting in accordance with nature, in their own understanding, of course, and in general, the practice of arguing and explaining how and why we should do these things. Another important notion is that in life there are things we can control and things that we cannot. You can't influence the weather, so you shouldn't worry about it. However, you can choose how you want to react to it. If it is not up to you whether it is raining or not, why would you feel bad about it? The main idea is that you can make the decision not to care about things beyond your control and become calmer and happier. Marcus Aurelius, one of the five good emperors of Rome, writes the following in his personal journal, called Meditations. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Obviously, as we are human beings with instincts and feelings, we can't always or completely be emotionally independent of the influence of the outer world. 
Maybe this is the reason why a lot of people today have an alternative interpretation of the word stoic. An apathetic person, someone who has shallow feelings about others and the world. Nevertheless, modern stoic thinkers argue that this is a false interpretation of the philosophy and that it isn't about suppressing our emotions, but mastering the control of them. Another common, but not necessarily true idea that people have is about philosophy itself. They say that it is a boring and useless activity involving thinking about the meaning of life and discussing pointless theories. However, the Stoics are famous for actually using what they say and acting according to their principles without hypocrisy. In other words, they truly want to live their philosophy. Quoting Epictetus, the Greek Stoic slave who was freed later, don't explain your philosophy, embody it. The Stoics believed in strict virtues as well. To be exact, they had four of them. Wisdom, justice, courage and moderation. Eudaimonia, which has a meaning close to happiness, could be achieved by exercising these virtues. Seneca, the Roman playwright and financial advisor of Nero, writes the following. You ask what is the proper limit to a person's wealth? First, having what is essential and second, having what is enough. We have arrived at a very interesting and controversial topic on Seneca, because if we read some basic history of the times, we can see that he accumulated a huge amount of wealth in his life and didn't necessarily practice temperance regarding alcohol either. On the other hand, there are obviously counter-arguments to this accusation as well. First of all, nobody is perfect. We know that Seneca had many political enemies. In fact, Nero, the psychotic emperor of the era, wanted to execute him several times meaning that he probably had a very difficult and stressful life, even taking into consideration the historical differences compared to our era. Another counter-argument regarding his enormous fortune lies in the interpretation of Seneca's writings. Some say that he wasn't against wealth itself, but against passion and uncontrollable emotions. Namely, he wanted to reach apathia, the absence of passion. This is a common mindset even nowadays. One can enjoy things as long as they do not become dependent on them. The Stoics argue in a similar way to Buddhists. If we want to live a good life, we shouldn't get too attached to anything, because nothing in life is permanent and we might lose them. This may be why Stoic philosophers often practice negative visualization or permeditatio malorum, the practice of imagining things that could go wrong or be taken away from us in the future. With contemporary eyes, this exercise might seem counterproductive, the general self-help narrative is that we should visualize only the good in order to be less anxious or even manifest what we want, according to the law of attraction. However, the Stoics were definitely right in one thing, sometimes what we visualize or desire doesn't happen, or in some cases, the exact opposite does. They often wanted to prepare for the worst possible outcome, so that if it comes, they could react to it in more virtuous ways. The Stoics had many other ancient Latin phrases as well, such as memento mori, meaning remember your death. As discussed earlier, they understood that nothing in life is eternal. They knew that the day of death will come, no matter what. Now, remember one of the basic principles of Stoicism. If we cannot change something, why worry about it? Well, this is where that notion comes from. The most difficult thing in life, death itself, is inevitable. Should be so, why not accept it and do the best we can in our lives? and why this might be the most difficult or even an impossible thing one can learn in his or her life, it might be the most important and advantageous. Chapter 3. Digging Deeper – Two More Trials in Stoicism If we want to understand Stoic philosophy at a deeper level, we can turn to the three disciplines of it – perception, action and will. The first two are very easy to understand. Perception is how we see the world. Action is what we do based on this knowledge. Will is slightly more complex. It's the ability to accept what we cannot control and endure difficulties. These three disciplines are codependent. They form a never-ending circle. We perceive, act and accept. They cannot be divided. How we think about something always deeply influences our actions. For example, if you think you are stupid, you won't study, since your belief is that you would fail anyway. However, we have the power to change our mindsets. The Stoics say, if you perceive things in the right way, you are able to improve your abilities, act accordingly, study and don't give up, and accept what you cannot control. 
not understanding something is normal and part of the process, you will become happy. Nevertheless, it is important to mention that in original ancient Stoicism, this formula was only used with the goal to act in more virtuous ways. Only today do we interpret Stoicism in a freer way and use parts of it to achieve what we want, regardless of the original aim. Another trio in Stoic philosophy are the so-called pillars of it, physics, ethics and logic. In ancient times, this kind of division was usually in the structures of philosophies. If we want to understand exactly how this works in Stoicism, there are two metaphors we can mention. In one of them, Stoicism is an egg, in which the yolk is physics, the white is ethics, and logic is the shell. In the other one, think about a garden, in which the soil is physics, the fruits are ethics, and the fence is logic. Ethics is about what is right and wrong, logic helps us decide and gives us a framework for reason, and physics forms the basis for everything. It allows existence to be possible. Logos is another term, meaning the force that controls everything in the universe, but I let this one be for those who want more profound theoretical knowledge on the topic. If you fall into that category, check the description. Chapter 4 Stoic thinkers throughout history to this day Having covered the basics of the philosophy, let's see something different now. How the world reacted to Stoicism and who have been the ones that used it as their personal way of thinking. Politicians There are several famous politicians, military officers and even presidents from the US and other countries that have been proponents of Stoic philosophy. To begin with the founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, through Theodore Roosevelt, one of the most influential American presidents, to today's popular politicians like James Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense of the USA, we may encounter a long line of great names. James Stockdale, an American admiral, survived as a war prisoner in Vietnam with the help of Epictetus' Handbook of Stoicism. Or if we look at other countries, Wen Jiabao, former Prime Minister of China, has read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations over 100 times, or even Arnold Schwarzenegger, who probably doesn't have to be introduced, is a fan of the philosophy. Not to mention Nelson Mandela, the anti-racist South African politician, who became the first democratically elected president in his country after being inspired by meditations. Authors after surviving Holocaust, Viktor Frankl, an Austrian neurologist of Jewish descent, founded Logotherapy, a school of psychotherapy that is deeply influenced by Stoicism. Later, he wrote about his survival and philosophy in his book Man's Search for Meaning, which has been referenced by many popular writers in the 21st century, such as Robert Greene and his mentee Ryan Holiday. Both of them are in a close relationship with Stoicism, especially Holiday who has had a huge role in popularizing it with his best-selling books, such as The Obstacle is the Way and others. Or we could mention one of the most famous authors of all time, J.K. Rowling, the founder of the Harry Potter universe, who is also a fan of Marcus Aurelius. According to Nassim Nicholas Taleb, another present-day philosopher and writer, a stoic is someone who transforms fear into prudence, pain into transformation, mistakes into initiation, and desire into undertaking. Professional Athletics There are many proponents of Stoicism in the sphere of professional sport as well. The books of Ryan Holiday as well as original Stoic writings have heavily influenced NFL's several teams and coaches, such as the New England Patriots, Nick Saban and others. We could also mention Chandra Crawford, an Olympic gold medal winning cross-country skier who practices Stoicism. Business In the domain of business and marketing, Stoicism has become extremely widespread and loved. However, this is not a new phenomenon. Zeno, the founder of the philosophy itself, was a merchant. Today, the entrepreneur, angel investor and author Tim Ferriss is one of the most famous proponents of Stoic philosophy, but other leaders and CEOs like it as well, such as Jack Dorsey, the co-founder of Twitter. Other spheres of life in the world of music, the famous pop singer Camila Cabello or Luke Fiesco, Grammy Award winning rapper, both love Stoicism. According to Massimo Pigliucci, a present day Stoic philosopher, 
In the world of fiction, even Spider-Man could practically be considered a stoic due to his mindset. With great power comes great responsibility. There are some popular movies in which stoic philosophy is portrayed as well. In Gladiator, Marcus Aurelius can be seen at the beginning of the movie as a wise leader, or the series Reign of Blood on Netflix is about Commodus, who is the son of Marcus. By now, we can see why stoic philosophy is so widespread. It is compatible with any religion, nationality and profession. However, we may ask an important question. Is it really stoicism that has helped these famous people become successful, or are we trying to prove what's true, according to what we want to believe? It seems to be a logical argument that stoicism, as a whole, is not necessarily meant for good performance, but there are some important aspects of it that can influence one results and success. Also, we have to see that not every big thinker or famous person has been so supportive of stoicism. In the last chapter, we are going to discuss some of the arguments and counterarguments regarding stoicism and its usefulness. Chapter 5 Discussion A collection of arguments and counterarguments about stoicism. Debate 1 The dichotomy of control and innovation. As mentioned, the distinction between what we can control and what we can't is one of the most important notions of Stoic philosophers. Although they claim that we have to learn the wisdom of being able to see the difference between the two, it is questionable if we can really do that in every situation. When Stoicism was founded in ancient times, science was very undeveloped. Therefore, it is understandable that they were certain that some things could not be controlled, for example the weather. However, the weather today can actually be foreseen and even manipulated, and our ability to do this is in constant development. In fact, one of the main features of science is to question what we know, and discover new things, understand the world in novel ways. If we are certain that something can't be changed, we won't even try, hence the innovation and scientific development would be impossible. In the sci-fi series Altered Carbon, death can be avoided with the help of technology. This may not be a realistic dystopia, but it can help us understand my argument. Even death, the thing that the Stoics were most certain about, can be seen in a different light. Returning to reality, there are thousands of discoveries that have changed the way we think about the world besides weather manipulation, which would have been impossible without the scientific mindset, such as how our solar system works, traveling on Earth and in space, computers and AI, or medicine, which brings us to our second debate. Debate 2. It's just not that easy to accept death. Epictetus writes in his Anchoridion, As you kiss your son goodnight, whisper to yourself, he may be dead in the morning. The mindset behind this, as discussed previously, is to prepare in advance for the things that may go wrong, even for death. To modern ears, this may sound harsh and absurd, and for a reason. Obviously, terrible things happen today as well, but science and medicine have improved so much in 2000 years that tragedies like this happen much less frequently. Therefore, the goal to disconnect ourselves from the things that we value due to our human nature is unrealistic. If we try to harmonize so much with nature by saying that everything that happens is inherently good or neutral, we can become too unattached from our emotions. We simply can't accept death so easily through devaluing and rationalizing it. This argument may shed light on why the Stoics might have been so brave. If death doesn't matter so much, what you should be afraid of? Debate 3. Stoicism may not always be appropriate for solving your problems. Amor fati, meaning the love of our fate, is an expression coined by Epictetus, but made famous and explicitly expressed by Nietzsche. Thus, a lot of people think of Nietzsche as a follower of Stoicism. However, it is only partly true. In fact, the 19th century German philosopher often criticized Stoic philosophy. He didn't necessarily think about it as a correct way to see the world, but he thought it could be useful in violent and uncertain times. There is another reason why Stoicism might not be the best way of resolving conflicts for everyone. Some people are open to solving their problems through logical reasoning, but others prefer talking about their feelings and receiving empathy from their friends, which is hardly a part of Stoic wisdom. There are some very complex problems in our lives that can't be dealt with in obvious ways, like various types of mental disorders, 
PTSD syndrome and many others. Of course, we have to be careful when looking at an ancient branch of philosophy with modern judgement, but I still feel the urge to mention this. Women simply weren't perceived to be as valuable as men by the Stoics, probably because back in the times, predominantly masculine attributes such as physical strength and emotional indifference were considered more important by society. However, accepting and being mindful of our emotions is important for everyone, even for the grittiest and strongest Stoics out there. Other arguments If we are unbiased and try to see Stoic philosophy as it is, and also find less subjective resources about it, we can see that it has many parts and aspects that are not as progressive as its supporters claim. It had its opponents and critics even in ancient times, such as Cicero, who talked about Stoicism paradoxes, and of course, the Epicureans, who believed that seeking pleasure and avoiding pain is a fundamental part of human nature. By the way, this notion has become one of the basic elements of modern evolutionary psychology, together with several other ancient branches of philosophy that influenced modern psychology. Another example is cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, rooted in Stoicism, which helps people identify and change their thoughts and behaviors. Returning to our arguments, we have to add that the Stoics weren't picky. If they judged some part of Epicureanism to be true or useful, they used it. Many people believe that they were very strict and certain about things, but this is only partly true. For example, Marcus Aurelius was not a determinist, as most other Stoics. He wasn't sure whether circumstances are determined by the will of God or by the random motion of atoms in the universe. To be precise, he thought it didn't matter, as death is unavoidable anyways. If there is providence, we go to a good place. If there are only atoms, we simply cease to exist resulting in the cessation of pain and anxiety as well. One of the greatest things about Stoic philosophy lies in its compatibility with different religions, but according to a Hungarian critic and influencer, Puget Robert, this absence of belief in transcendence in modern Stoicism can be a deficiency as well. In the debate about God's existence, many people say that we don't need a transcendent power to believe in, we, as communities and individuals, can be good and happy without it as well. However, Puget argues that without common faith that is eternal and unchangeable, such as Jesus Christ, society won't know in the long term what is good and what isn't. Conclusion If you came here in love with Stoicism, but by now you feel lost, I have to let you know, I felt the same. During my research, I realized that Stoic philosophy isn't as beautiful and perfect as the self-help industry is telling us. But this doesn't mean that it is not useful or that it couldn't help us reach our goals and live better lives. We have to realize that despite its deficiencies, that, by the way, every trend has, Stoicism can help us a lot if we use it as a tool to make decisions in our lives. Even Ryan Holiday believes that if we have problems, philosophy and therapy work best together. Stoicism can be very helpful for reaching our goals and reducing anxiety, but it is best used today by complementing it with the science of psychology and modern personal development. If you want to deepen your knowledge about Stoicism, check the description and the comment section. If you don't agree with what I say, feel free to debate, share your own thoughts and arguments. And if there is one thing to remember from this video, it would be the following. Use Stoic philosophy as a tool to grow. But never stop thinking critically about it. Nothing in life is perfect or unquestionable.